Welcome everyone to our final Boise ITSM Talks meeting of 2023. Hard to believe we're already in December, but I'm very excited to uh, cap off the year on a very strong and high note. Really awesome to have Jeff Rumberg here presenting for us this month. And uh, welcome, Jeff. Thank welcome you. To Great to be here. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Welcome to all of you who are attending. I know it's always an effort to take time out of your day to attend meetings and webinars and appreciate everyone taking time to attend our December meeting today. Uh, let Jeff introduce himself in just a minute. Thanks to him for being our presenter. And of course, we know we have some first timers here and want to uh, make sure at the end of the session, if you can stick around, we have, we'll have some time for some Q and A's and some intros after the presentation and look forward to digging in deep into our subject for our meeting today. Just a real quick slide. We always talk about our vision and our why for starting this group. We want to encourage attendee participation and deliver information that's actionable coming out of our talks. And the why is to inspire all of you to become better leaders and to continue to fill the voids in our organizations where we can look at ITSM as a larger umbrella and something that can bridge the different frameworks and the capabilities that are out there. And excited to have Jeff here because ultimately being able to have a subject matter expert in the areas of metrics and measurements and how we can tie that into AI is going to be really exciting for all of us to have some good takeaways I know coming out of our meeting today. So our presentation, the current state of AI and IT service and support. Uh, Jeffrey Rumberg is the managing partner for MetricNet LLC. I'll let him go ahead and take over sharing and introduce himself and kick us off today. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you so much. It's. Uh... My pleasure to be here. Um, let me see if I can uh, go ahead and share my screen there. Let me know if that came up. Are you seeing my screen at this point? No, not yet. Okay. Let me give this a try. There you go. Excellent. Uh, great to be here. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. I'm honored and, and humbled to be a presenter for the first time with this group. Uh, some of you know me, but not all of you know me, so I'll give you a, kind of the brief rundown. I've been in the IT service management space now for almost 35 years. I uh, started a company called The Verity Group back in the early 1990s, and we launched something called the Help Desk Benchmarking Consortium. And for a relatively small fee, any help desk anywhere in the world could submit data to us and we would consolidate that data and create comparisons, graphs, charts, and reports and send out benchmarks to everybody. Uh, so as far as I know, that was the first attempt to benchmark help desks, which of course later became service desks. Uh, we later expanded the practice into contact centers, desktop support and field services. And then at the uh, end of 1999, I uh, had an offer from Gartner uh, to purchase the company, and I agreed to that. And so on the last day of 1999, I sold my first company, the Verity Group, to Gartner and took a position there as the uh, global director of their IT benchmarking practice. So I stayed at Gartner for a number of years and uh, ran their benchmarking practice. But uh, around 2005, 2006, I got the itch to go out on my own again, so I founded uh, MetricNet. Uh, same products, um, service and support benchmarks, desktop support, service desk, field services, as well as contact center benchmarks. Uh, however, a very different uh, business model this time around. We streamlined the process, uh, made it lower cost for us, and hence we were able to drive our prices down pretty significantly. And uh, we're now uh, the number one provider of service desk, desktop support, field services, and contact center benchmarks uh, in the industry. So we've created a huge database um, of uh, thousands of IT service and support organizations. About AI, current state of AI. And everything you see in here today is empirical in nature, meaning that it represents our observations in the industry, how the industry has evolved, and how AI and machine learning is transforming the industry and will continue to transform the industry uh, for many years to come. So without further ado, uh, let's dive into the presentation, and I'm going to start at a very high macro level. We're then going to drill down to the more tactical micro level implementation of AI and machine learning, 
then we're going to come all the way back up to this macro level and talk about what the implications are for IT service and support and AI and machine learning going forward. Now, our global economy is about $85 trillion, and that represents all goods and services. So all the agriculture, all the computer manufacturing, all the computer services, all the business services, all the transportation, everything globally, uh, the GDP is about $85 trillion. Now, um, the plurality of that, roughly one third is North America, not surprisingly, uh, the second largest concentration would be Southeast Asia, and then we've got 7% in Japan, about 19% in Europe, and, and so on. Now, the way we break that down uh, starts to become interesting because IT is more than 5% of the total. It's about 7% of the total. So we got about $5 trillion of that $85 trillion global GDP represented in information technology, everything from managed services you know who the big names are, the IBMs and the DXCs and the Genpacks and the Wipros and the TCSs of the world. Uh, everything from the services to the hardware and the software, it's a big, big industry now. So about 7% of the total global economy. Now, if we drill down still further, IT service management is about 1.5 trillion. So that's about 2% or not, a little bit less than 2% of the global economy. And that's all IT service management. It's not just service desk and desktop support and field services. ITSM, of course, is broader than that, but it's a one and a half trillion dollar market. And if we think about IT service and support, the aforementioned service desk, desktop support, field services, that's about a $250 billion market. So a good sized market. Uh, and it employs about 7 million people worldwide. So that's what we're going to be talking about today is this $250 billion market that employs 7 million people uh, worldwide. Now, like all industries, uh, the origins of this industry were fairly humble. This photo was, um, I think, taken in the 1950s or 1960s. I don't know the exact date, but it's a NASA data center and you can see the IBM mainframes humming away in the background. And there's two red circles on this chart. Uh, those circles are uh, showing the rotary dial phones that represented the early help desk. And typically when those phones rang, it was one of three or four issues. Uh, one issue would be, I need my password reset. Another issue would be that I ran, I just ran a COBOL or a Fortran batch job and it needs to be rerun. Can you run that batch job for me? And the third one was typically a connectivity issue. Uh, these would be big universities or huge corporations that were connected to these IBM mainframes. And if they lost connectivity, they couldn't do their uh, data processing. Now, what's notable about that is that password reset way back then was the number one category of ticket in uh, the service desk, what they called the help desk at the time. Today, all these years later, 60, 70 years later, believe it or not, it's still the number one category of ticket. We've come a long ways, but in many respects, um, there's a, still a lot of low hanging fruit. And some of that low hanging fruit would be represented by uh, easy, uh, easy to extinguish uh, incidents like password resets, uh, Microsoft Office, Outlook. Uh, some of these can be automated away uh, quite easily. But yeah, password reset, number one category of ticket way back then when this picture was taken and still today, it represents more than 25% of all tickets. And the good news is they can be, uh, the majority of those can be automated away through RPA, their various RPA meaning robotic process automation, as well as various other tools. It doesn't actually require machine learning to automate uh, the user authenticated password resets. But this is what the early uh, help desk looked like. And uh, of course, we've come a long way since then. If we look at the history of IT service management over the last uh, little more than 50 years, as a discipline, IT service management um, was invented, for lack of a better word, in 1972. That was also not coincidentally when we started to see the large scale deployment of ACDs, automatic call distributors, and VRUs, which is voice response units. And so we started to see automation of these um, contact centers and to a lesser extent, uh, the help desks. And then in 1980, we started to see some uh, remote tools, uh, benchmarking, the introduction of IDLE in 1985 under the government of Margaret Thatcher in the UK. 
They were trying to figure out whether or not they were getting value for the trillions or the billions that they were spending on information technology. So they invented this discipline called ITIL, which used to be called the Information Technology Infrastructure Library. And then we saw kind of a Cambrian explosion in 1990 of you know, knowledge management, self-help, self-service. The first HDI conference uh, was in the early 1990s. And I was a speaker at that conference. It was at the Moscone Center in San Francisco. And uh, to my knowledge, I'm still uh, the only person that's ever spoken at every single uh, national uh, HDI event. So I've had the privilege and the honor of speaking at uh, all of their national events since the first one in San Francisco. Uh, towards the end of the decade, we started to see the adoption of chat and then uh, HDI certifications began around the turn of the century, 2000. Um, IT service management, uh, ticketing systems, the early systems like Heat uh, and ben, ben Data, and uh, some of those systems started to become more full featured. This is when you know ServiceNow came of age, Remedy BMC. Uh, Sharewell, some of these tools, they started to become more full feature. They weren't just ticketing systems. They were tick they were systems that incorporated uh, idle uh, and other uh, processes. And so we saw a massive maturation of the ITSM systems. And by 2010, there was a lot of focus on shifting left because organizations rec recognize it by shifting tickets to the left. And I will show you a diagram on this you can greatly reduce your total cost of ownership and also improve the customer experience pretty significantly. ROI started to become fairly important, which was a good thing because historically, IT service and support was viewed as nothing but a cost center. However, most support organizations, unbeknownst to them, are actually creating value through shift left and by deflecting contacts or tickets into lower cost channels. Uh, and also returning productivity to end users. And we can actually quantify all these things and we can calculate an ROI. So if the 1970s were about the invention of ITSM, the 1980s were all about idle, and the 1990s were all about these new processes like uh, incident problem knowledge management, uh, the introduction of self-help, self-service, the 2000s saw a lot of new uh, SaaS tools, ITSM tools, and remote diagnostic tools like BombGuard, LogMeIn, and the like. Uh, the 2010s were about uh, ROI and the maturation of ITSM systems uh, and IDLE. This decade, um, without a doubt, is going to be about AI and machine learning and the massive reduction in human resources required uh, to deliver IT service and support. And that's not an ominous statement. Uh, it's just a matter of fact. And uh, I'll have a lot to say about that as I get a little bit further into my presentation. So that's a real brief sort of a overview of the last 50 years of IT service management. So of course, like a lot of industries, uh, this one has evolved uh, quite a long ways, uh, particularly in regards to the personnel. Uh, if you, I go back a couple slides of that picture, basically you had data center operators that would answer phones and take messages and they would send those messages to some other individual to run a batch job or reset a password or check the connectivity to a big university or a large corporation. Uh, but they weren't really adding much value. They were basically message takers. And today what we're starting to see is the advent of IT support engineers who actually direct the machine learning and the robotic process automation. They direct the bots. They tell the bots what to do. Uh, and that's a far cry from you know, sort of the passive agents who would take messages and send those along to somebody who was more qualified than themselves and could resolve these tickets to the talented technicians and agents and analysts that we see today that are very qualified and, you know, are able in some cases to drive a an 80% or 90% first contact resolution rate. And as I mentioned, we're starting to see the advent of these uh, tech support uh, engineers who are not so much resolving issues, but they are working as co-pilots alongside of AI bots and machine learning. And they are directing these AI bots and machine learning uh, to preemptively eliminate problems before they generate tickets and ticket volume. We have IDLE 4. It's been almost four years now since IDLE 4 was uh, developed. And then uh, as regards to the technology, that's really the focus of this uh, discussion is artificial intelligence and machine learning which AI can really be broken down into two broad areas. We've got robotic process automation, which is the voice and chatbots, and we have the machine learning tools, which are not as mature yet as the uh, RPI 
our RPA tools, the robotic process automation tools. And we'll discuss that as we get into this, but we've clearly evolved uh, a long ways and we're at an inflection point now. And I know that term is overused. It's a bit of a cliche, but an inflection point simply means if, if you're into calculus, you know, the first derivative tells you the slope of the uh, curve. The second derivative tells you how quickly that slope is changing. An inflection point represents a significant increase in the second derivative, meaning that you're starting to accelerate um, the, the curve. So the curve is starting to either bend upward or downward at, at a more rapid pace. And so a, an inflection point would be you know, typically described as you know, second derivative of you know, 2.0 or greater, meaning that the acceleration is, is increasing fairly quickly. Now, what are the manifestations of this? Well, um, AI is increasingly gaining social acceptance, especially in IT service and support. It's not feared the way it used to be. That's a significant driver, the adoption of AI. Uh, advances in data science, you've heard the term big data. Well, uh, big data is making possible AI and robotic process automation, massive computing power, and the reduction in the cost of that massive computing power. And then, of course, every support organization always experiences cost and quality pressures. So we have this perfect storm of uh, the industry being willing to accept and adopt and embrace AI, these massive advances in big data, computing power, cost of which has come down dramatically, particularly cloud computing power, and then the pressure to continuously reduce cost and improve quality. So the bots have been here for a while, for at least 10 years now, we've seen uh, automation where at the commodity end of the ticket spectrum, so think of commodity stuff as being, uh, think of commodity uh, tickets as being password resets, Microsoft Office, Windows, um, Outlook, for example. A lot of that can and has been automated away now. Um, and the bots, this looks like a very ominous chart, and it's sort of meant to be because we've already seen the displacement of human resources in the sense that the AI is now intelligent enough to be able to do a lot of the really commodity type stuff. Now, as you become more advanced and you talk about vertical specific hardware and software, the AI and the machine learning has not caught up to that yet, but eventually it will. So I think of the this complexity spectrum, uh, about one third of the complexity of the tickets is can be automated away at this point. Then there's another third where there's progress being made. These are specific uh, applications and infrastructure uh, that might be unique to healthcare or higher education or transportation or business services. And we're starting to see some progress in that area as well, meaning that some of those tickets are being automated away, either preemptively, meaning that they never become tickets, or uh, retrospectively, meaning that the ticket emerges, but it's quickly extinguished through automated problem management or voice and chat bots, um, or in uh, some ways, uh, endpoint bots, for example, where anomalies are identified in the IT environment and there an alert would be sent to IT so that they can resolve the issue or that anomaly would be um, corrected. For example, taking a server offline when you know before it fails and starts to uh, generate tickets. So the bots are here, they've been here for a while uh, and they are accelerating fairly quickly per this chart on the prior page. Uh, they're rapidly maturing. Now, OpenAI, ChatGPT, I just put that as an example on the right-hand side, but it's not nearly as all-pervasive as one might be led to believe. Of course, it gets a lot of headlines, uh, but we have not yet, uh, I personally have not yet seen uh, ChatGPT uh, deployed in an IT support environment in any meaningful way where I can say, yes, it's preventing tickets or yes, it's rapidly resolving tickets uh, when they emerge. So there's a lot of talk about open AI and chat GPT for a lot of different reasons, but I haven't seen any real successful deployments of that. It doesn't mean it's not going to happen, uh, but this is just one of hundreds of AI tools out there. It's the one that gets the most headlines, uh, but as of yet, I haven't seen a lot of inroads being made by chat GPT. Some of the other tools that are out there, Watson, for example, uh, we've seen some significant progress of tools like that in terms of rapidly resolving issues, the voice and chatbot uh, automation, for example. But the first real example of machine learning happened back in the 1980s with IBM. They programmed a computer called Deep Blue to teach itself how to play chess. 
And initially, Gary Kasparov, who was at that time the best chess player in the world, uh, would beat you know the IBM Deep Blue in every match. A, a chess match is you know the first person who wins uh, 11 out of 20 games, and Gary Kasparov would win 11 games consecutively. And initially, the problem was that the IBM engineers were trying to teach the computer how to play chess, and they finally realized that if we're teaching the computer how to play chess. None of us are as good as Gary Kasparov. So of course the computer is going to lose. So why don't we teach the computer how to teach itself? Why don't we uh, figure out how the computer can learn from itself and look into the future, two moves, three moves, five moves, 10 moves. And if you get to 12 moves in the future on a chessboard, you're talking about more than the number of atoms in the universe, You know, 10 to the 82nd power. It's a big number of moves. Well, Deep Blue can look into the future that many moves and can figure out you know, what is likely to work the best at any given point in time. And it eventually, in the early 1990s, ended up beating Gary Kasparov. And um, I, I believe in individual games, it may have been beaten by some of the chess grandmasters since then, um, but no one has actually beat uh, Deep Blue in a full match, meaning uh, the best of 20 games. And so machine learning, that was the first manifestation. Um, you know, fast forward 30 years, and we're starting to see now these tools pervade IT service and support. Again, at the commodity end right now, which if you're not automating away most of your password resets, most of your Microsoft Office, most of your Windows type stuff, Outlook and so on, uh, you're missing a big opportunity because those are softballs. Those are real easy to automate away given the tools that we have in the industry right now. Now, what's driving the adoption of AI uh, can be explained in part by the shift left diagram that I'm showing here on page nine. And what we have is the fully loaded cost of resolving a ticket at various levels within an IT organization. So on the far right, we have vendor support. So this is when you call a, um, a Microsoft or an Oracle or any other vendor for help in resolving an issue. And on average, the cost of those vendor resolved tickets is about $600. That's what it was in 2022. But the variation on these numbers is quite extreme. These are averages. I've seen vendor tickets resolved for $50 and I've seen vendor tickets resolved for $25,000. So the cost on the vendor resolution can be quite high. We move one step to the left, we have field services or field support. Last year, the average cost of a fully, fully loaded average cost of a ticket was $221. But again, the variation around that was huge. So again, these are averages um, and they can vary quite extreme by orders of magnitude from the average. Level three IT, meaning like a, a NOC or an application group, for example, fully loaded cost of support last year was about $104 a ticket. Desktop support was around $70 a ticket. Level one service desk, $22 a ticket. Self-help, self-service, $2 a ticket. Problem management, I put the number zero there, but the reality is you're actually creating value there. If you can prevent a problem from, uh, from disrupting a user's productivity, you're actually creating economic value. We just don't know what that you know, prevented value is or what the value of that prevention is. So I, I just put the number zero there as a placeholder. The reality is we can't measure what was prevented. And this is true of any preventive measures, um, you know, whether it's fire prevention or accident prevention or anything like that. Problem management is meant to eliminate tickets uh, from a root cause perspective. And in so doing, you prevent the largest cost of that ticket, which isn't the the internal cost of uh, eliminating that ticket, it's the productivity impact that it has on the end users. If you can prevent that productivity impact, the negative productivity impact to the end user, then you're creating positive economic value for the organization. Now, it was only recently that we put the level minus two on this chart because we started to see credible examples of AI and machine learning in this environment that would preemptively seek and destroy or search and destroy, identify anomalies in the IT environment and either send an alert to IT so IT could resolve a, a, an issue before it started to generate tickets or it would preemptively resolve the issue. It might take a machine offline, for example, it might reboot a printer, could do a lot of different things. But this is what the TCO, total cost of ownership, looks like when you add up the volume of tickets at each level of support and the fully loaded cost of a ticket at each level of support, you get your TCO, your total cost of ownership. 
And as you can see here, if you move a ticket, say from desktop support to level one support, you're going to save you know, $45 a ticket. If you move it from vendor support to level one support, you're going to save on average, you know, $575 per ticket and so on. So shift left is a powerful driver in that as you shift left, you resolve tickets more quickly, but more importantly, you reduce your total cost of ownership. And that's uh, perhaps uh, the biggest driver of the adoption of AI and machine learning is the ability to shift left resolve tickets more quickly, and then ultimately get to level minus one and level minus two, where you fall off the left-hand side of this chart and you reduce your TCO by preventing tickets altogether. That's what level minus one is. We used to call it root cause analysis. Now idle's given it the fancy name of problem management, but that's really all problem management is, is a root cause analysis and elimination of the drivers. Now, I, I mentioned earlier the social acceptance of uh, AI. And we did some research at MetricNet uh, not too long ago, where we asked uh, a number of questions, but the three most important questions are, are gonna be shown on this in the next two pages. Uh, they were actually statements, and we asked the individuals who responded whether or not they agreed with these statements. The first one was that my organization would benefit from AI problem detection and resolution. There were 217 that responded. And out of that, 63% either strongly agreed or agreed with that, which was a surprise to us. We didn't expect to have uh, so many positive responses. We also asked about automation and specifically ticket categorization. Many of you know that ticket categorization, that is properly assigning a ticket to a category, you know, hardware, software might be one category. You might go down further than that, talk about a connectivity issue or a software bug, for example. But ticket categorization has been problematic in this industry for decades. And many organizations, the number one category of their ticket would be other, meaning that it's not assigned to any of the other categories. It's not uncommon for an organization to have, you know, 50 or 100 or 200 different categories and subcategories of tickets. But many agents and technicians don't take the time to properly categorize the ticket, so they stick it in the bucket of other. Uh, and so it's not a surprise here that 69% uh, either strongly agree or agree with the statement that their organization would benefit from automatic ticket categorization. And the machine learning tools that are out there actually do a pretty good job of this. And it's interesting to see how some of them will take the existing categorization of tickets from any big organization, doesn't matter who it is, General Electric, United Airlines, Wells Fargo Bank, or anybody else, they'll take the existing categorization and recategorize it based on the AI diagnosis of what drove the ticket. And typically the recategorization doesn't look anything like the initial categorization. And that's both good and bad. The good is that knowledge and problem management depend in large part on the quality of the ticket categorization. It's bad because most ticket categorization isn't very effective, but the good news is machine learning is making that far more effective. We also asked if you could have anything you wanted or make changes you would like to make in IT service support, what would be number one on your wish list? Well, 26% said we want AI and machine learning. Secondly, some communication issues. Thirdly, better knowledge and self-service. Better knowledge and self-service are both dependent upon the maturation of AI and machine learning in the IT environment. So these three slides are meant to represent the sea change that I showed on this chart right here, which is the social acceptance of AI. That was a prerequisite to seeing the adoption of AI and machine learning in the IT environment. Combine that with the uh, big data, advances in data science, low cost computing power, cost and quality pressures as manifested here on the shift left diagram. And you have a perfect storm uh, for the large scale adoption of AI and machine learning. Now, of course, I'm always asked about job losses. And in fact, um, Angela, um, our company president, she's on this call. She and I were in uh, Dubai a couple of years ago, and I did a presentation on AI and machine learning. And at the end of that presentation, there was a journalist there that asked me a question. And um, she said, uh, it, at least in my mind, it, it was the, the tone was somewhat accusatory. And she said, what are you going to do about all these job losses that are brought about by AI and machine learning? And 
she didn't say, what is the industry going to do about it? She said, what are you going to do about it? As though it was my responsibility to figure out, you know, how to prevent these job losses. Uh, fact is, there are going to be a lot of job losses. I, I'm project, uh, projecting that probably 90% in the next uh, 10 years. Um, and, you know, my answer to this journalist was the same answer I'll give you here, which is that this, first of all, we can't stop it. So some of you have probably heard in the last few months that there are industry, supposed, supposedly industry experts on AI and machine learning that want us to take a pause on the deployment of AI and machine learning, which is foolish and ridiculous. That won't happen. Uh, the, you know, innovation doesn't stop because people feel the need to figure out what are the long-term implications of this technology. They didn't stop when semiconductors were being developed, when computers were being developed. Uh, they didn't stop when you know language processing was being developed, and they're not going to stop now. So this idea that we're going to take a pause and figure out you know how to put guardrails around AI and machine learning that just isn't going to happen. There will be negative consequences. We know that, um, and I'm not talking specifically now about job losses, but we do know that there will be job losses. But it shouldn't be a surprise to us because it's been going on for ten thousand years. You know, ten thousand years ago, humans were hunters and gatherers, running around in the forest looking for mushrooms and acorns, but eventually they figured out agriculture. They started planting wheat and corn and other crops, and small villages started to build up around these agricultural enclaves, if you will. And so humans figured out agriculture, and they got out of the cave, and they got out of the, you know, subsistence style of living, you know, looking for mushrooms and acorns, and they started to plant rice and corn and wheat and other crops. And eventually they figured out that animals might be able to, domesticated animals could help them farm, plant and harvest the crops. And then around 1800 at the advent of the industrial revolution, we started to see large scale machinery being used in agriculture. And during the 19th century from 1800 to 1900, there was a complete flip in the number of farmers versus the amount of farmable land. The number of farmers was reduced by 99% over that century from 1800 to 18 or to 1900. Our number of farmers was reduced by 99% and the amount of farmed land increased a hundredfold because the world population increased so much. That's what the industrial age, that's what automation did for farming. Increased farmland a hundredfold, reduced the labor content by 99%. So a complete reversal in, in labor versus farmable land. Same thing happened in telecommunications and in auto manufacturing. Now past is prologue. You've read Shakespeare, or even if you haven't, you've probably heard this expression before. It's from a play called The Tempest. And in its most benign form, it simply means we can learn from the past. And in a more aggressive interpretation, we might say we can predict the future based on the past. <laughs> But the idea here is that we can think about this evolution of humankind, telecommunications, farming, and the like, and manufacturing. And look at what's happened in the past. The two pictures shown on this page are about 60 years apart. You have a 1960s assembly line, left-hand side, auto assembly line, a 2015 auto assembly line, right-hand side. The difference is left-hand side, very labor intensive. You've got laborers, with wrenches, manually assembling automobiles. The right-hand side, which you have are a bunch of robots that are welding, painting, assembling, doing the inspection. But what you don't see are the laborers because they've been replaced by the bots, which you can see, and engineers. They're about 1%, 1 to 5%, we don't know the actual number, between one and 5% as many engineers on the right-hand side as there are laborers on the left-hand side. Those engineers are behind safety glass and they're looking at how well the bots are doing. They're telling the bots what to do. They're adjusting tolerances, making sure they stay within you know, control limits on the thickness and the reflectivity of the paint, on the quality of the welds, uh, and so on. Well, by the same token, the service and support industry is moving away from a labor-intensive industry to an automated industry. So we shouldn't be surprised by this because it's happened many, many times before in a lot of different industries. So past is prologue. And what we can learn about the past is that the future holds great promise for individuals that are 
committed to this industry. It's not just about job losses. And by the way, I've been doing, I've been working in this industry now for more than three decades. I've never once seen layoffs in IT service and support, whether it's for level one technicians, agents, desktop support, field services. The reason is that this is a high turnover business. On average, in 2022, in worldwide, uh, the turnover among level one support engineers was about 40%. Mm -hmm. Uh, for desktop support and field services, it was a little bit less than that. It was a little bit less than 30%. But the fact is, when organizations adopt technologies that automate away the need for human labor, particularly in IT service and support, usually you can take care of the excess labor with attrition. So I think this idea that you know there's now social acceptance of AI, we have already a high attrition industry in a roughly 40% per year. It sounds really terrible to say, oh, we think that there's gonna be 90% job losses. This is my prediction. Maybe it's only gonna be 80%, but I'd be surprised if it was anything less than that because the AI and machine learning is, is growing so quickly. There is, a good, there is a good punchline at the end of this. So I don't want you to think that this is all gloom and doom. It's not that at all. In fact, I, I think there's a very positive message uh, at the end of this. But nevertheless, this is what's going to happen going forward. Uh, and it's no surprise because it's happened time and time again in multiple industries is that technology is displacing the need uh, for manual labor in this particular industry. Uh, a couple of case studies, this is from Autodesk. Uh, they've seen with their AI and machine learning deployments, 30% uh, reduction in response time. CSAT went up by 15%. Handle time Labor per ticket goes down by 40%, and their FCR is at 90%, which is an extraordinary number. So when you talk about better, faster, cheaper, higher quality, quicker resolution times, lower total cost of ownership, that's the holy grail. That's what you're after. And any successful AI deployment is going to make your environment better and or faster and or cheaper. If it doesn't move the needle on one or more of those three dimensions, it hasn't succeeded. So better, faster, cheaper is the same thing as cost quality cycle time, uh, same thing. Uh, and you've probably heard it before, but in reality, a successful IT deployment of AI and machine learning has to move the needle on one or more of the dimensions. Typically we're seeing movement in all three dimensions, better and faster and lower cost over time. If we look at Microsoft, they've used AI to drive labor out of tech support. They've improved CSAT by 20%. There's a common misconception that as AI and machine learning begins to uh, take hold and uh, saturate IT services support, that it's going to reduce the quality of the customer experience. Um, and in some cases that might be the case, but in general, it's not the case. In general, those organizations that are successful at deploying AI and machine learning are seeing improvements in the customer experience. Uh, largely because the resolution time is quicker and the first contact resolution rate is higher. 40% uh, now without human intervention for AI-driven tech support at Microsoft. Um, Watson is the branded AI tool of IBM. It's not a machine learning tool. It's a rules-based tool. So it's what we would call R RPA, Robotic Process Automation, Voice and Chatbots. They've reduced um, the time that IT professionals spend on repetitive tasks. So it's not just service and support, but all repetitive tasks by 50% and a 70% decrease in mean time to resolve for issues. Now that's huge because during that mean time to resolve, uh, one or more individuals is going to see their productivity impacted. Typically it doesn't mean that you are out of business while you're waiting for a ticket to be resolved, but it does mean that your productivity is going to be impacted to a certain extent. And if you can reduce that mean time to resolve by 70%, you are also reducing the productivity impact by at least 70%. So this is a this focus right here is on the faster, you know, the better, faster, cheaper. We're talking about um, reductions in cycle time here, but those reductions in cycle time do have an impact on total cost of ownership. Now, one of the big implications of AI and machine learning, and I alluded to this earlier, is that we're going to see support agents and technicians evolve into support engineers. What's the difference? Support agents and analysts tend to be very reactive. They're focused on return to service. 
not root cause fixes, but quick fixes and return to service. They're preoccupied with service levels, speed of answer, mean time to resolve, for example. Schedule adherence is a big driver of compliance with the agents and the technicians. On average, starting salaries in North America for a level one support agent are about 45K a year. By contrast, the support engineers we're starting to see right now, primarily in places like Santa Clara, San Jose, and elsewhere, they're much more proactive and strategic. They think prevention, not resolution. They look for root cause fixes through uh, formal problem management. They're obsessed with eliminating tickets, not just resolving and returning to service. They want to get rid of tickets altogether, reduce ticket volume. And they focus on project work, engineering projects that are designed to eliminate tickets from a root cause perspective. And the starting salaries, part of it is the location, mostly you know Silicon Valley, um, but the starting salary is around 110K uh, per year. This is a transformation that we expect to see happen as IT service and support goes from labor intensive to automation intensive, much like the auto industry did over the last half century. Now, some of the things we expect to see along with that are the support engineers who are going to thrive and succeed in this environment are going to think like business people, not like technicians, um, not like IT people. They're going to think and act like business people. They're going to understand the metrics of service and support and more broadly, ROI, which is a metric return divided by investment. Benchmarking is increasingly being adopted. You know, as recently as two years ago, only about 10% of IT service and support organizations would benchmark annually. That number has roughly doubled over the last couple of years, and uh, it's gaining rapid adoption because it is a low cost, easy to deploy tool, and very easy to act on in terms of identifying opportunities to become better and faster and cheaper. So we're starting to see that um, uh, pervade the culture. And then lastly, an understanding of what the business case for AI and machine learning is. And I'll talk at, at, at length about that business case momentarily. But when I think about support engineers and what it's going to take for them to succeed in the IT support environment of the future, these are five success factors uh, that come to mind. Let me elaborate on these. A business focus means that you understand how economic value is created. I'll show that to you momentarily. You leverage metrics just like any business would. Businesses look at return on sales, return on investment, um, return on equity, and a variety of other financial metrics. The same thing is true if you're running an IT support business internally or not. You know, you don't have to be an MSP, a managed service provider, to run an IT support business, but you should be leveraging metrics. You should think prevention, proactivity, strategic. Under process aware simply means that process drives performance. And as processes mature, performance also uh, matures and improves. And then internal messaging is about making sure that the, your value proposition is well communicated, well understood. And a big part of that value proposition is the ROI of service and support. Being able to calculate that and demonstrate that is key to success uh, going forward. Let's talk about being proficient with metrics because this is one of the great weaknesses we find at MetricNet. We do more benchmarks than anybody in this industry. And uh, almost universally, what we find is that many support, most support organizations, the vast majority, in fact, are weak on metrics. They don't understand the metrics. And what I'm showing here is a standard set of metrics that you would find for a level one service desk. It's not all inclusive, but these are the 20 plus metrics that we use when we do a, when we do a benchmark for a service desk. What's more important is understanding these cause and effect relationships. So what are the drivers of cost and customer satisfaction, the so-called foundation metrics? Cost per contact being your primary measure of efficiency, customer satisfaction being your primary measure of effectiveness. They are driven respectively by productivity, analyst utilization, and, and first contact resolution rate. And we have a tertiary level of metrics we have job satisfaction, which turns out to be a very important metric. It has uh, implications for both customer satisfaction and cost per contact. And then we have the drivers of job satisfaction, which are coaching, training, and career pathing. Most organizations in IT service and support don't understand the most important metrics of IT service and support, and they don't understand the cause and effect relationships. 
But this ecosystem is very important for any organization that's trying to get on and stay on a steep path of continuous improvement in IT service and support. They need to understand these cause and effect relationships. The dark blue boxes are the KPIs, the key performance indicators. The light blue boxes, they are metrics, but not necessarily key performance indicators. The key performance indicators are the strategic drivers of performance in a support organization. So value creation, I've spoken about this already. You can create value by shifting left. As you shift left, you reduce your total cost of ownership. Eventually, you reduce ticket volume altogether at level minus one and level minus two. So you can create value by shifting left. You can also create value um, by changing your channel mix over time. Over the last 15 years, we've seen the percentage of inbound volume in service desks decreased dramatically from almost 80% to uh, about 30% over the last 15 years, while at the same time, the chat volume has gone up, the web ticket submission volume has gone up, the email uh, is a dying channel, it's only about 2% of the total now, uh, we're starting to see walk up, and it represents about 4% of the total now. Uh, self-service has been a disappointment. Um, many organizations thought that self-service was going to uh, take over the world, and it still can have a significant impact on a support organization if they are willing to adopt the appropriate tools to enable users to self-resolve and, and you know, self-serve uh, themselves when they have an issue, particularly related to some of the commodity end of the spectrum uh, tickets. And then we have SMS as well which is a relatively small part of the total. Now, what's interesting, when I superimpose upon this, the cost per ticket, you can see why this has happened from an economic perspective. So the cost per ticket is a yellow line here. You saw a big spike during the pandemic, went up to $26 a ticket, has come back down to about $19 a ticket. But you can see that over time, how the cost per ticket has gone down as the channel mix has changed. So that was the economic driver. But there was also a... Um, a, a uh, uh, demographic driver, meaning that as newer people entered the workforce, uh, they were less willing to get a ticket resolved through chat or voice. They would typically Google a solution or ask somebody they knew for a solution. Only then would they possibly do an email or maybe submit a ticket by web, but chat and voice were considered the path of greatest resistance. And so we have two drivers here. The economic driver is easy to see. The demographic driver is not as easy to see on this particular chart, but both of those things are driving this change in channel mix. And that has reduced the, and this is just showing the level one cost per ticket, but it has reduced the cost per ticket at level one um, through uh, the deflection into these lower cost channels, voice being one of the most expensive channels. The other source of value creation, in fact, the most significant source of value creation in service and support is what I'm showing on this chart. And let me explain what we've got here. If you're lucky enough to work in an organization that delivers top quartile IT service and support, far left-hand blue bar here, on average in a year, you're still going to lose about 17 hours of productivity due to various IT-related outages, incidents, service requests, and the like. If you're unlucky enough to work in an organization that has fourth quartile service and support way over here on the right-hand side, you're gonna lose on average about 47 productive hours a year. So on the left-hand side, you lose two productive days a year. On the right-hand side, you lose about six productive days a year. That's the impact of the lost productivity of these tickets uh, in IT service and support. And this is the linkage between the quality of service and support and the economic impact of the lost productivity. So if you're doing a really good job on average, top quartile, your end users lo lose a couple of productive days a year due to their IT related incidents, service requests, outages and the like. And again, fourth quartile, you're losing more than a week of productivity. So for those organizations that are delivering high quality service and support, you are saving productive hours. You're returning those productive hours to your end users. That can be monetized. Imagine being in a large company like Walmart. We did a calculation for them recently. Hundreds of thousands of employees. If we save each one of them four hours a year, eight hours a year, 12, 16, 20 hours a year by delivering high quality service and support, meaning quick resolution times, or better yet, fewer tickets altogether, 
So instead of each end user having 1.1 tickets per month, they have 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 0 0.5 tickets per user per month. You're returning a lot of productivity to those users. That can be monetized. We know what the average salary is. We know what the fully loaded cost of an FTE is. We can multiply the hours saved by the FTEs. And if you're saving every FTE in an organization 10, 15, 20 hours a year, multiply that by thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of individuals in those organizations, monetize that productivity savings. And what we find is that the productivity savings is typically 5X, 10X, sometimes 20, 25X more than the annual cost of delivering service and support. So the ROI, the return, is largely the result of return productivity. The investment is the annual operating expense. Now, the value creation doesn't stop there. You also create value in, in the following sense. Customer satisfaction with all of IT is a function largely of customer satisfaction with service and support. Now, think about this. Service and support represents only about 4% of total IT spending. So you add up all the level one support service desks, desktop support field services, divide that by total IT spending, and it's about 4%. Yet that 4% has the ability to reduce, improve user productivity dramatically, reduce total cost of ownership through channel mix, and drive customer satisfaction with all of IT, not just service and support, but all of IT. This survey essentially asked more than a thousand organizations, what drives your opinion of IT? Well, the number one answer was service desk. The number two answer was desktop support, which makes sense if you think about it, because this is where end users have their most interaction with IT. They don't interact with the NOC, the data center, the application developers, the networking people but they do have frequent interactions with service and support, the service desk and desktop support. So naturally, if you're delivering high quality there, you're gonna drive a very positive view of all of IT. And so when we coach our executive clients, we put this chart up without much explanation. We simply ask them, you know, what does this mean to you? And one of the best answers we got was from a new CIO. Um, she'd been in the position, you know, less than 90 days. And her answer was the following. She goes, oh, this represents job security. Because if I'm interpreting this correctly, and she was right, if I focus on service and support and make sure they have the tools, the resources, the training, they have everything they need to deliver a high quality product at level one, desktop support field services, customers are gonna be not just happy with service and support, they're gonna be happy with all of IT. And so that's going to make me look good as a new CIO. And that represents job security for me. She was boiling it down to something really basic. If service and support is really good, all of IT looks really good, regardless of whether or not all of IT is really good, because this is where users have their interaction with IT. So if this looks really good, the rest of IT looks really good. So those that work in service and support have a special opportunity as well as a special responsibility. It's two sides of the same coin you represent the, you're the gatekeeper, if you will, for all of IT, what happens at this interface between IT and the customers dictates how customers feel about all of information technology. And so the message to our executive clients is focus on service and support. Maybe it's only 4% of total IT spending, but this is where you get the biggest leverage in terms of driving customer perceptions about all of information technology. Mentioned yep. earlier, yeah. Sorry to inter interject real quick. I just want to do a quick time check. We're down to five minutes till the top of the hour. So I know we have a few folks that need to leave. I thought I'd just ask to see if it'd be okay to pause. And if anyone that does need to leave has a question, if you'd be willing to take a question or two on what you've presented so far. Absolutely. And then there's a, let me open the chat box because it looks like there's a couple of chats there and they may have some questions in them. For uh, folks that maybe need to jump here at the top of the hour, anybody have a question that they'd like to ask or any uh, comments so far? We have a couple of folks that said they couldn't stay for the full um, extra time. Don't be shy. 
jump in or raise your hand, either is fine, or, or type something in the chat box if you'd like to. Uh, one question I had um, was around you, the one chart there talked about and still showed voice as being, I think, the highest percentage of support contacts, but certainly chat coming up, you know, growing and all that. So my question is, how is AI going to impact or may impact those voice interactions in support? Uh, voice bots, chat bots. Um, keep in mind when when I show the voice channel, what I mean is the human assisted uh, voice channel, meaning you're talking to an agent, not not a bot. Um, and so these all represent um, human assisted channels. So um, a ticket that uh, is uh, a voice ticket means that you've got an agent talking to a customer. A chat means that you've got an agent chatting with a customer. So none of the automated channels are these are all human assist channels. Is okay, what thanks. Here. Yeah. But 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 then the kind of the follow up then, but what we're seeing is AI is definitely going to um, impact and do, like you said, the chat bots is going to handle a lot of the FAQs mm -hmm. and, and even more complex things and some of the um, web submitted, all that. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. So this diagram won't change that much for the human assisted tickets. But what's going to happen is that if you think about the pie chart of human assist, you know, being once, you know, part of the pie chart, and then you think of AI and machine learning as being another piece of it, as that slice of AI and machine learning grows from 1% to 5% to 10, 20, 30, 40, 50%. In fact, there's a case study at the end of the presentation that shows an organization that was going through an AI transformation that expected within three years to have more than 50% of their human assisted support automated away, um, that, uh, that automation support, you're replacing a variable human labor cost with a fixed technology cost that gets amortized over a large number of tickets. And so this diagram for human assist tickets won't change that much going forward. It will continue to evolve you know, voice will become less and, you know, walk up and web submit will, will grow. But if your ticket volume goes from, and we did this for a large insurance company in Texas, um, in, within one year, they went from 160,000 tickets per month to 80,000 tickets per month, largely as a result of automated problem management and some endpoint bots. They reduced their ticket volume by 50% in one year. This is uh, a, a snapshot of what the labor and channel looks like for human assist, but it doesn't show the reduction in ticket volume through automation, both robotic process automation uh, and machine learning. So I expect these trends to continue for the human assist tickets, but what I'm not showing on this chart are is the growing percentage of AI and machine learning tickets where human resources will be replaced by bots, you know, voice and chat bots, and eventually machine learning and endpoint bots. Uh, AI tools like that, and the amortized cost of that technology over the ticket volume that's reduced is far, far less than the cost per ticket of the human assist tickets. Thanks, thanks. No, this is this your presentation. All this data has been very, very uh, enlightening. Thank you. All right. So I know, again, we're about at the top of the hour. Folks have to drop off. Uh, understand I'm going to continue and let Jeff finish his presentation. We'll make sure we get the recording posted and the link to that will be sent out, out on Meetup and LinkedIn so folks can catch up with, with uh, the end of this if they had to uh, jump away uh, here at the top of the hour. But uh, with that, uh, I'll go ahead and let Jeff continue. Yeah, I just want to point out that uh, at the end of my presentation, and I, I didn't intend to go through these slides, but I, I wanted to leave them in the presentation for those that might want to look at a sample AI business case. This was a large, you would know the name of the company if I gave it to you. They're in the Fortune 100 large corporation that was largely agent assist. You could see, for example, that 70% phone and IVR, IVR is interactive voice response, 26% was a self-service portal, and then another you know, 4%. Um, chatting with agents, and they were envisioning what was called a touchless uh, support desk. They wanted to get away from human-based support entirely. They're now, you know, in the second year of this three-year transformation. They're ahead of schedule, but they expect to reduce their ticket volume per capita by 50% at the end of next year. Um, 
You can follow this case study and see what they expected, uh, how they expected to reduce their price. Currently, they're spending about $3.50 per user per month on support. By the end of year three, that number is going to be down by two thirds to $1.20 per user per month. Ticket volume changes dramatically, agent assist blue line going down, robotic process automation and ticket reduction through idle. And in fact, um, I'll make a point here, which I didn't make earlier. Um, idle and the big three idle processes in level one support are uh, knowledge, incident, and problem management. Most organizations have failed miserably on all three of those. Um, the reason is that when an individual is given responsibility, say for incident management or problem management or knowledge management, it's usually in addition to everything else they've got going on. So it represents just some part of the time they're supposed to allocate to their job. They usually don't give it their full time and attention. Moreover, combine that with high turnover in the industry and you never get much continuity in service in, in those three idle processes of knowledge, incident, and problem management. So as a result, I have yet to see an organization that has succeeded to any degree, you know, worth mention in those three big idle practices. But what we're starting to see now with uh, machine learning in particular is that there are some very good use cases of organizations that have automated problem incident and knowledge management. So we are seeing traction in idle, particularly those three idle practices. There's now 34 idle practices in idle four. And with machine learning, we are starting to see some real value in, in those three big idle practices. Whereas historically, there just wasn't enough focus, not enough labor to focus on that. And also combine that with the high turnover. And most organizations never really gained any traction when it came to those uh, idle practices. So I think machine learning and AI will be kind of the salvation of idle, uh, if you will. So big reduction in ticket volume. Um, these were their uh, cost and savings projections. By year three, they expect to save 66%, two thirds of their cost versus the current state, which they you know started out at uh, two years ago. So at these um, slides are available for you if you just wanna follow a case study, monetize customer value. I alluded to earlier, the idea that as you return productivity to your end users, you can monetize that if you know how many hours you're saving, how many customers there are, what it costs, you know, it's their salary, their benefits and their overhead. You can turn that uh, labor savings or that productivity improvement into a monetized value. And that's typically the largest contributor of ROI in service and support. And you can see our client was projecting an ROI in this three-year deployment of RPA and machine learning to be uh, 2424. That that simply means, you know, it sounds 2,424%, simply means a 24 fold, 24 X improvement in ROI. So the return is what they invest in the technology. The investment is what their annual operating cost is uh, for uh, delivering service and support. So uh, that case study is there. If you're interested, you can see how the ROI evolved over time. Uh, and then for those that are interested in learning more about AI, there's some free resources, Google AI, for example, Coursera, and also Udacity. Um, but I, I'm always uh, careful to point out that you don't need to understand the nuts and bolts of AI to benefit from it. Um, much like those engineers on the auto assembly lines are using applications uh, to ensure that the bots are doing what they're supposed to, um, the bots in the future of AI service and support will be a co-pilot to the technicians or the uh, engineers that work in AI, that work in IT service and support. And you, they will teach you how to use them is what I believe is going to happen. Nevertheless, there are individuals that do want to learn more about uh, AI and machine learning, specifically as it comes, as it relates to IT service and support. And there are these free resources available to you. So um, I'm happy to take additional questions. I didn't want to cut the Q&A session short, but uh, um, before I take those questions, I just want to say uh, thank you to Ryan and Jeff of the I ITSM group there in Boise for inviting me to speak today. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. And if you have additional questions, I'll stay on uh, the webcast as long as you would like to ask questions. Yeah, honor to have you. And this has been a fantastic presentation. Really appreciate taking the time to be here. There's one question that Judy put into chat, 
which I don't know if you saw, Jeff, around um, asking who paid for the implementation in your uh, case study scenario there for the AI and the tool cost, process cost, supplier work. I don't know if you want to come off mute, Judy, and, and elaborate more on that, but uh, that's one question I see that's out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you got the hard Jeff, my, oh. Yeah, Jeff, my question is really around in the supplier uh, customer organization relationship. Um, who actually paid for those costs? I know I, I really like seeing the decrease in cost to the customer, mm -hmm. but uh, did, was that all inclusive or were those costs uh, held somewhere else as part of the project? Yeah, it was all inclusive, uh, Judy, in the uh, what I would call the hard costs. So when you're purchasing hardware or software from a vendor, that's pretty easy to keep track of. Uh, and then if uh, a vendor is working with you to implement these technologies, you can keep track of those costs. But the myriad costs internally of individuals who work on these projects oftentimes is not tracked very well. Sure. And so what we're representing on these charts would be the, uh, the hard costs that are relatively straightforward to track. So what are the vendors charging you, the hardware and software vendors, um, both for their product, you know, the SaaS products and the hardware, but also their implementation time. We can track that pretty easily. But the internal time, um, most organizations don't do a great job of tracking the cost of their internal projects, mm -hmm. whether it be for AI or anything else. So you bring up a good point, which it's not um, monetizing, it's not let alone, it's not tracking, let alone monetizing uh, the cost of that in internal support. And it can be significant. It's front end loaded, typically, but over time, it's got to be managed internally. The vendors have to be managed. Uh, hardware, software also has to be managed. So um, your, your point is a good one, I, I think, if I'm understanding your, your question properly, which is that there's a lot of internal resources that go into making these kinds of things happen, but they are typically the hours um, and then the monetized value of that is typically not tracked very well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks for your response because, uh, yeah, those costs can be substantial in some cases. And uh, coming from a customer or supplier relationship, uh, there was always this uh, discussion, negotiation around, well, who pays all those costs? And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how do we how do we really prove the return on investment? Yeah, you know, for an organization that's really business focused, um, there is, uh, like any technology, there's going to be some upfront cost. But the reason you make that investment is because you expect it to produce some value in the long run. Mm -hmm. Now, the ROI uh, methodology that I outlined, you know, shift left, deflect mm -hmm. contacts into lower cost channels, uh, and then return productivity to end users. We've got some white papers on our website about that that talk about how you collect that data and how you would actually measure the ROI. But one of the great things that's happened in this industry over the last five years is that by and large, the industry has gotten away from the idea that service and support is just a cost center. And so it's a cost of doing business that doesn't create any economic value. Most IT organizations now understand that effective service and support creates value through shift left, through channel mix, and most importantly, by returning those productive hours to the end users. And so that mind shift from service and support as a cost center to service and support as a value center has been a huge benefit to the industry. Because if I'm a rational manager and someone in service and support comes to me and, and demonstrates credibly that they have an ROI of 300, 400, 500% or more, uh, I'm going to say, how, how can I get more of that investment? What do you need in terms of human resources, training, technology? What do you need to give me more of this 400% ROI? And so that's the way we want people thinking about service and support is not as an expense and a headcount to be minimized, but rather as an investment that will drive benefits for customers, not just in terms of the customer experience, but in terms of their overall productivity. And so that's been a huge change. Uh, not much has been said about it, but we track this and, and it represents, I think one of the biggest sea changes in this industry is the perception away from service and support is nothing but a cost of doing business to service and support as an investable asset. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to dive into more of those cost savings to determine, was that just really people costs, you know, due to headcount uh, reduction or, you know, were those actual costs? So thank you. That's helpful. 
Yeah, it's it's largely labor uh, because service and support is about 70 percent labor. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the rest is the tools, the SaaS tools, uh, the, the, the hardware, the space and, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. But these are labor intensive functions. So when you see big cost savings, it's always uh, it le most of its labor as yeah. opposed to other line items. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Does anybody else have any other questions? Yeah, just going to ask. I have one that I'll ask Jeff, which I was at the Service Management World Conference here a couple of weeks back and saw a couple of the tool demos and the vendors have with how they're starting to integrate AI into their tool suites and talking about, you know, some of the same concepts with ROI of investing and, and having the tools continue to evolve. Where do you see the inflection point from that perspective as far as where you think we'll really start to see critical mass with the ROI being realized as people either see their existing tools evolve to where it's adding that value and some of the things that I know you and I talked about ahead of this presentation, just with some of those prerequisites that need to be in place in order to take advantage of that. If you wouldn't mind speaking on your thoughts on those two areas real quick. Yeah, the RPA tools, uh, primarily the voice and chat box, those are proven technologies at this point, and it's pretty easy to make the business case. In, in other yeah. words, the, the highly positive ROI. What isn't as well proven uh, are the machine learning tools. Now, I divide those into two, two categories. There's the endpoint bots, um, which uh, essentially, as the name implies, they monitor your endpoints, your desktop computers, your servers, your printers, um, all the endpoints of, of the giant network that you operate within. Um, those uh, are, uh, and there aren't that many endpoint tools out there, but the ones that exist, they're pretty easy to prove, much like when Bomgar and LogMeIn came onto the scene within the last 10 years, and we could demonstrate that the first contact resolution rate improved dramatically using these, uh, these remote control tools, and that the uh, customer satisfaction improved and the first contact resolution rate, as I mentioned, uh, also improved. The endpoint bots are proving uh, pretty easy to justify from an ROI perspective. What's harder to justify, uh, at least so far, are these AI tool, machine learning tools, I should say, that ingest huge amounts of information from the ITSM system, from the remote control system and the telephony system. So a tool like Zebrium or Swish, for example, will be looking at the Remedy or, or ServiceNow or ShareWell, or you know, there's hundreds of tools out there. I'm not recommending any one tool, but these SaaS, these machine learning tools will ingest data in real time from the ITSM system, from the telephony system, from the remote control system, from the knowledge system, if you have a separate knowledge system, and we'll be comparing real-time data to historical data and asking what's different. And because of big data and massive computing, it will find the answer to that and say, well, something is happening today with Outlook. We're seeing twice as many Outlook calls as we do historically, or something's happening today with VPN token lock because we're seeing, you know, uh, we're, we're looking at 100 calls today, and historically, we only get about 10 or 12 calls. It looks for these anomalies, and it seeks to either uh, address it um, without sending an alert to IT, or it sends an alert to IT so IT can address it. These tools, I, I think, are still not proven. I, I've seen demos, but de demos do not you know, an effective tool make. It's very different when you get a demo of a tool versus when you deploy a tool in, in the real-time IT environment. So I think the voice and chat bots and the endpoint bots are pretty easy to cost justify. You can develop a credible ROI uh, analysis around those tools. The machine learning, I don't think it's quite there yet. It's not far away, but I would be very cautious about making too big an investment in the so-called machine learning tools that ingest the, you know, through big data, ingest huge amounts of information from the ITSM system, the telephony system, and the remote control system, and attempt to go out there and proactively eliminate tickets from their source. I, I just haven't seen enough evidence there yet to justify, uh, you know, a positive business case. Thank you for that. That answers my question is along the same lines of your thoughts on demo versus reality. I think that's kind of where I saw things being at here. From, yeah, uh, I've never seen a demo that wasn't. I've never seen a de demo that wasn't impressive, <laughs> but, but I've seen a lot of situations where an impressive yeah. demo turned into a really disastrous deployment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Understood. 
or Any additional costs. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. All right. If well, there are any other questions, I'm going to go ahead and take back over sharing real quick and just conclude with my summary slide, and then we'll, we'll wrap up the uh, recording here. All right, so I'm just going to quickly show announcements. Our next meeting, I'm in negotiations with our next speaker to try and uh, get that lined up. I should have that done by the end of this week, early next week, targeting January 16th for our next meeting. I'll get that announced and posted as soon as that's official. Um, some of the other links that I typically show, we've got uh, our link here for up upcoming training classes for MITSM Academy, who we're happy to partner with. Um, our Boise ITSM previous recordings are here on our YouTube channel. ITSM Academy does monthly webinars, which is where I originally, I think, saw Jeff out in the uh, outside of this meeting was at a previous ITSM Academy webinar. They're having Neil Keating coming up on Thursday, December 13th to talk about implementing XLAs, which should be a really good presentation. Um, the Treasure Valley Agile community has their next meeting on Thursday, December 7th in downtown Boise. Um, events for PMI, Western Idaho chapter um, link is here. And of course, encourage everyone to continue to connect with us on Meetup in our ITSM LinkedIn group. And as I mentioned, once we have uh, this recording saved out and posted, I will make sure that link gets out to uh, our audience. So that for those that didn't get to see either the end of the presentation or ended up not being able to attend today, we'll have that opportunity to catch up. And uh, again, really think this is one of the best presentations we've had in this group, Jeff. So again, appreciate you being here very much and Angela for your help in coordinating and uh, really uh, grateful to have you here and uh, yeah, present. Thanks, Jeff. thanks, Ryan. It was a pleasure. All right. Terrific. With that, I'm going to go ahead and end the recording and we'll see everyone in our next meeting.